In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is class nine in the course we've been calling our struggle, about the struggle of the True Orthodox Christians in the 20th and 21st centuries against the heresies of ecumenism and the apostasy of surgeonism, and in general, the apostasy and modernism that has gone on in the institutional Orthodox Church in the past century. And lately we've been reading and studying a very important essay by Professor uh, Ivan Andreev entitled, Is the Grace of God Present in the Soviet Church? So we've already had two sessions on this, reading the introduction by Father Christopher Birchall, then last, in our last class digging into the essay itself and going through the first few pages of the essay. But tonight I'm going to make an excursus. An excursus means we're going to take a little detour out of the course, but an excursus in academic writing is always for a purpose. It's because we're talking about a very important topic related to our central topic. So our excursus tonight is about two important points of corroboration of the importance of what we're doing. Somebody might ask, well, why are we studying this 1948 essay? Uh, isn't the, the whole Soviet period, isn't that over? That's long gone, and we shouldn't be thinking about those things. But um, actually, what we're doing is very important. And I've had an impressive confirmation of the importance of this study, first of all, from the publisher of our book. So our, our, book, our little booklet, Is the Grace of God Present in the Soviet Church by Andreev, is published by Monastery Press in, in Alberta. And the publisher is Father Andrew Kensis. He lives in Dermission Skeet in Wildwood, Alberta, and he serves the Church of St. Vladimir in Edmonton, Alberta, a longtime church of the Russian Church Abroad, a longtime parish of the Russian Church Abroad. But Father Andrew did not go along with the... Um, the, the uh, capitulation, the, the auto-demolition of a large part of the Russian church abroad in 2007, falsely called a union. It's not, it wasn't a union. It was an absorption of the Moscow Patriarchate and, and a destruction of the Russian church abroad. He didn't go along with this, and he is currently uh, commemorating our Bishop Metropolitan Demetrius of America, of the GOC. But uh, Father Andrew is a longtime priest in the Russian church abroad, and uh, he's published some very important books. And the present st study, uh, I just found out from his email, was commissioned by the late Metropolitan Vitali. And Father Andrew was a spiritual child and close co-worker with the late Metropolitan Vitali. So the publisher of this work, Father Andrew, wrote us recently, he wrote me an email recently, to thank us for our efforts to discuss this landmark monograph publicly. Maybe we're the first ones to discuss this thing publicly now in 20 years. I don't know. And he wants to give a, and this email, his email, email, I'm going to read it in full because it's very valuable because it gives us further insight to how this English translation came to be made and who opposed it. Uh, it was, it was made and it was distributed in the teeth of certain people who didn't like it. And uh, it's important to know who they were and why they didn't like it. Um, here's what he wrote. And also, Father Andrew also makes remarks about the, the enduring value of this work. It's not, it's not time-bound. It's not chronologically... Uh, it, it, it didn't have a short shelf life. It's still very important. It wasn't chronologically bound. It's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a work of permanent importance for the children of the Church. So Father Andrew wrote me uh, recently. I heard about the podcast this past Sunday. He, he wrote on October 27th, New Style. That's um, what just... Um, what about last week sometime, right? It was or sometime last week. I heard about the podcast this past Sunday with a few from a few parishioners who listened to your offerings. By the way, one of his parishioners is a sister in Christ who donated the microphone we're using. So, God bless her. Um, it's, I'm, I've heard that audio quality is much better now. Father Andrew goes on. We were quite intrigued, so we listened to part one on the way home from church. It's a long drive every weekend. Father lives and Matushka live out in Wildwood Skeet, which is some distance from Edmonton where, where they serve their parish. In all caps, Father Andrew says, thank you, thank you. You completely understood the point of the book. It's, very, it's, very, um, it's a great moment for a, a writer or a publisher when someone reads a book and really gets the point, really, really, really get the book, right? That's true and just in secular literature, right? When an author or a publisher gets feedback and, and he sees that a, a reviewer or a critic or um, a, a learned reader has really gotten the point of the book. It's, a, it's this wow moment, right? You understood the point of the book. I almost broke down and cried while driving. In all caps, somebody got the point, finally. <laughs> um, he goes on. 
Metropolitan Vitali approached me in 1998, asking me to get it translated as he wanted this book out in English. So it's going on in the late 1990s. Metropolitan Vitali is beleaguered. The forces that want to join the Russian Church abroad to, to world orthodoxy, which I'm going to talk about a little later from personal experience, these forces are beleaguering him. He's like a hero surrounded by a circle of enemies, and he's trying to fight off this avalanche now, this, this, uh, this seems like a, a juggernaut towards absorption into the Moscow Patriarchate and, and union with world orthodoxy, which was going on in the late 90s and reached its climax in the early 2000s. So, and Father Andrew was one of the few priests really loyal to Vlika Vitali and really helping him, you know, to fight this. So Father Andrew goes on, I gave the book to my mother, who had translated The Royal Way of the Cross. I think uh, some of our listeners may have gotten, ordered this book from Monastery Press and have read The Royal Way of the Cross. That was translated by Father Andrew's mother. Um, after that, I sent the translation to Jordanville for review. So he's being very cautious. He's being obedient, right? His mother translated it, but she's just one Russian speaker translating it, um, a pious and learned Russian, but still one person. So they sent it to Jordanville, to the seminary, you know, the, uh, the spiritual intellectual heart of the Russian church abroad, for review, thinking, well, they just need to, they'll clean up the Russian, you know, they'll point out a few things. I received back the text, which I was told was gone over by Father George Schaefer, now Bishop George. He was higher monk George, Holy Trinity Monastery, Jordanville, known to many of us, I mean, he was well known, in the Russian, I, I knew him by acquaintance. Uh, he's now Bishop George of Rocourt MP. Okay, so by 98, this is in 98 now, or 99, and so what happens? Father Andrew goes on. As I went through both versions, the original text from my mom and Father George's changes, there was a section where Father George completely changed the meaning and thrust of the message, changing it to a more positive towards the MP tone. It didn't make sense what I read, so reviewing the phrase and comparing both versions, checking with a Russian dictionary, it was clear Father George changed the text to something that was not in the original. After that, I had to go through the entire translation again carefully. One has to recall what was happening in Rokhoreth at that time. Okay. What's going on here? When it finally came out in print, I recall Father Victor Potapov who's the rector of St. John the Baptist Church in Washington, a very influential and powerful archpriest in Rokor. I recall Father Victor Potapo denouncing the book on the Rokor clergy list. Back in the 90s, we had a clergy list. Uh, I don't know if it was the one I'm thinking of. There was a list, the pioneering list, actually one of the first forums for any Orthodox clergy in the world was the Indiana list run by the late Father Mark Gilstrap in the 1990s. At that time, there was a lively debate on this list uh, this forum for discussion between the pro and anti MP priests. We're, we're really fighting it out on, in this clergy list. And so Potapov says, "Do we, brothers, do we really need such a book at this point in time? Question mark, question mark, question mark. That was all it took, and the book hardly received any orders, Father Andrew says. So Potapov denounced it. All these clergymen were, so, oh, Potapov, he's a very important archpriest. He knows Russia. He knows the Moscow Patriot. We're not going to order this book. So Potapov, uh, so Schaefer tried to change the book, and Potapov tries to um, make, today we'd say cancel or deplatform the book. Okay. The book, Father Andrew goes on, the book I still consider to be our masterpiece. It's, it's the publication of his little house that he's most proud of. And as you rightly realize, it goes far beyond the title. Simply put, the book is about discernment, pointing out to us that we live for the life of the age to come. Even this explanation cheapens its profundity. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's, there's a lot to this little book. The introduction was the result of numerous phone discussions I had with Father Christopher Birchall. Father Christopher Birchall was a protodeacon. God rest his soul. I just found out from Father Andrew. I found out that Father Christopher reposed last year. Unfortunately, in Rokor MP, which you would never have guessed from reading that introduction. Right? <laughs> and, um, but he, he had numerous phone discussions with Father Christopher Birchall concerning the point of publishing this book. The why make the effort question. Why are we doing this? You know. And he and, he and Father Christopher agree that it's the point of the book is the discernment of falsehood. I even agonized over changing the title, as most would only see the t in the title an anti-MP polemic, pure and simple, and not give the book a chance. In the end, I decided to leave it titled as the author had titled it. 
But in the introduction, Father Christopher masterfully incorporated all these the themes and points that Metropolitan Vitali wanted a thoughtful reader to grasp. Remember, we went over that introduction the last two classes, and it is very beautifully written. It, it, it does weave together the main themes of the essay. And, it, and Father Christopher's whole point in the introduction is to point out the lasting value of the essay. It's not just a, we hate the MP, or, or down the MP, there are a bunch of KGB stooges. You know, not, not just some simplistic um, blast against these people, but it's, it's deeper than that. It's, it's drawing from the, the experience of the catacomb church, the experience of the Roe Corps, the experience of the confessing Russian church, lasting wisdom for the discernment of the spirit of Antichrist, the discernment of falsehood. And that's what Vladimir Vitali really wanted the reader to understand in Father Christopher's introduction. And Vladimir Vitali knew Father Christopher and Father Andrew very well. They were very close to Vladimir Vitali, and so they were, they were close co-workers in this whole thing. Father Andrew goes on. The footnotes, which are not in the original, are mostly my work, he says. So when, when it look, as we're going through it, when we read the footnotes, it's Father Andrew's work. But with input from others in Rokor at the time, who also comprehended the importance of this work, we tried to show the mind of the church. It is imperative to read the footnotes as they appear in the text. Now, I want to I make a footnote now about Father Andrew. Father Andrew and Matryoshka were very formed. Before they moved to Edmonton, they were very formed at Platina and by Father Seraphim. And, of course, we know Father Seraphim was very balanced, and he always discouraged bitter partisan spirit. He's always trying to lead his, his spiritual children to, to discern the deeper meaning of the events of the time, the deeper meaning of these divisions, the deeper meaning of these apostasies, to, to, to acquire a firmness of spirit, a clarity of wisdom, a compassion for your, those who oppose the church, but not giving in to the mind of apostasy, not giving in to the mind of compromise, but opposing it, but in love. And Father Andrew and his mother, I don't want to praise them uh, too much, um, but, you know, they really imbibe this, and they always exemplify this. So Father Andrew uh, and, and certainly Father Christopher, who wrote the introduction, are not wild-eyed fanatics or, you know, MP haters. They're people who want to be faithful to the mind of the church. And that's the point of our reading and studying this essay. He says, thank you again for going through this work. Interestingly, Matushka and I discussed reprinting this book this winter. So they... You know, they are, we were on the same wavelength, right? They, they, he and Matryoshka, Nina, had already been talking about reprinting the book. To keep it in print because of its importance in our times of counterfeits and, frankly, lack of sobriety among the faithful. You see, there's training from, there's training from Father Seraphim and Malik Vitali coming through. You know, this concern about spiritual fakery, the concern about counterfeits, the concern about lack of discernment. This is all a very, these are very persistent themes in the in the more balanced and the more the the deeper true orthodox uh, literature and thought of the past hundred years. Okay. In Christ, Father Andrew. This is an email received from Father Andrew Kansas of Monastery Press, October twenty seventh, New Style, twenty twenty three. That was last Friday. That was last Friday. Okay. Now, before going on, I want to correct something I said earlier. I said in a previous class, I said this essay had been available in English before two thousand. But I'm, I'm getting older, and I'm forgetting what sequence I've read things, so when I've read things. So it was not. This is the first time it's available in English, because Father Andrew's uh, mother uh, translated it, and Monastery Press published it at the behest of Lake Vitali in the year 2000. So this was the first time translated in English. Now, now I want to go back with Father Andrew's email, and I'm going to do a hermeneutic on this email. This email has a lot in it. Okay. First, he makes several important points. Um, so I'm doing a, I'm doing an apologia tonight for why we're studying this book, okay? and and Father Andrew makes a make ha, has made my argument for me. Okay. One, Metropolitan Vitali, the last right confessing first hierarch of the Russian Church abroad as it existed before the 2007 Union. So I'm not taking sides and saying that Vlika Agathangal or the others are not right confessing Rokor hierarchs. I'm just saying Vlika Vitali was the last right confessing. Uh, not unfallen, uncompromised first hierarch before the 2007 Union, uh, the old Rokor, as we say. He was the last one. And he, he commissioned this book. He commissioned this English translation because Vig Vitali did, he was very, very Russian, Russian to his fingertips. Um, but he did care about the converts and he knew that English, and he was very aware of worldly developments, he knew that English was the international language. 
So he thought it was, he thought it was very important to have this translated into English. And I'll tell you something funny about Zika Vitali. He did not like the United States. He was very European. He was extremely European. And when, when he was elected first hierarchy and had to spend time in New York, he felt exiled because he loved Quebec. He loved living in his skeet in, Que in Quebec. And, um, and people, uh, Father Boris, his driver, would drive him. They'd leave New York and they'd, they'd cross the border into Quebec and he'd breathe and go, ah, oh, you can smell the Canadian air. Oh, I'm out of, I'm away from those Yankees. Oh, you know, and so he wasn't, you know, he was very Russian, very European, uh, was not, was not an America, American of Phil, right? But he cared about the converts and he knew that it was important to have, for the whole world, it was important to have our literature in English. So he commissioned this work because he considered the work so important at that time, it was the late 90s and early 2000s, when the forces to liquidate the church abroad were working overtime, and they were, and nobody can tell me they weren't because I had a front row seat uh, to the, the clergy conferences and the talks and the forums and the stuff that was coming out. And all my friends were taking these all expense, all expense paid trips to Russia and staying at five star hotels. And, uh, coming back with nice vestments and things like that. Okay. So when the forces of the Russian church, these forces to liquidate the Russian church abroad were working overtime to bring about the captivity, and it is a captivity, it's not a union, that's so euphemistic, it's so, so dishonest. It's not a union, it's, it's captivity, it's liquidation, it's submersion, it's absorption, <laughs> uh, enslavement, but they're, they are like the low guy in the totem pole and hold MP organization. So Lydia Vitali said, this is important. I want this in English, and we're fighting this battle. I'm, I'm, a, I'm beleaguered. I'm, I circled the wagons. I'm fighting off these guys who want to destroy the Russian church abroad. I need this work out in English. Second, Harmon George Schaefer, then a monk at Jordanville, who's now a Roquart MP bishop, deliberately distorted the text to make it seem that Andreev had a favorable opinion towards the search and his church organization. But you don't deliberately alter texts unless you have something to hide and you have no argument to defend your position. Altering a text is that's automatically a signal that someone knows he, he's not standing on firm ground, that he's trying, he's trying to fool you because he knows he doesn't have an argument. Okay. He's afraid of that text getting out. He wants to cancel, deplatform that text. So he's got to change it. Or in the case of other Victor Potapov, just cancel it. Just denigrate it. Okay. Now, what's interesting about Father George Schaefer, now bishop in uh, Australia, and uh, some people might criticize me for talking about these personalities, but we have to talk about personalities. Because I need to illustrate uh, for our uh, younger audience the dynamics that occurred at this time. There are very, very uh, personal dynamics occurring throughout the Russian Church abroad at this time. People say, how'd that happen? How did how'd the union come about? It's because people who are staunchly MP suddenly flipped. And I know that Father George Schaefer was staunchly anti-MP at one point. I know he was from phone conversations with him and uh, with personal contact with him and personal phone conversations. I know that. I don't want to go into all the details, but I have positive knowledge that he was against the union with the Moscow Patriot. Then. And so, suddenly something flipped. And suddenly he was he was false doing committing a uh, a sin and a crime by falsifying a text. It would not make a man falsify a text, a, a, a man who's a priest, who's a monk, who's later going to be a bishop, right? If he is a bishop, if they are bishops. Um, what would make a man do that? Well, we don't know because we don't know the conversations he had with other people <laughs> who, were, who were engineering all these little treasons that were going on on the part of these people. So I'll go on. Father Victor Potapov, one of the leading agitators, and Father Victor Tapas was one of the, the leading agitators for the so-called union, he attacked the publication of this book simply through derision, without an argument. Just, ah, we don't need this kind of a book. Well, these, these crazy right-wing wackos, we're, we're about to approach the glorious union with the mother church. We don't need agitators like this stirring, you know, stirring up trouble. Just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? Forget that book. Because of his status in the Roquefort at that time, this is enough. His word was enough to keep a lot of clergy from buying the book and from distributing it. But we have to ask a question. You don't simply dismiss an opponent's arguments without a reasoned response unless you have something to hide, unless you have no argument to defend your position. Whereas he couldn't, he couldn't really argue against the book. He just had to blow it off. Okay. 
So altering texts, a form of, and then this deplatforming, this shows a profound dishonesty. This shows that these men knew they were on the, deep down they knew they were on the wrong side of the argument. And they had to use dishonest methods to get rid of this important essay by a man who was head and shoulders, you know, above them and, and who, um, who saw the truth of what he was writing about. Okay, so four, point four. The purpose of the original essay in 1948 and the purpose of its republication in 2000 was not simply to attack the Moscow Patriot out of a spirit of partisanship. But most importantly, the point of the essay was to express the mind of the church of all ages regarding the discernment of falsehood, regarding the, discerning the spirit of Antichrist. You see that, that, that Andrea keeps getting back to this theme of discerning, distinguishing between the spiritual and the falsely spiritual, discerning the good spirit, the spirit of God from the spirit of Antichrist. Thus, this work, as Father Christopher Birchall beautifully expresses in the introduction, this work is not an angry, it's one-sided polemic rendered obsolete by its being concerned solely with a long dead controversy. It's rather this essay constitutes a permanently useful, profoundly wise and genuinely spiritual instruction coming from an, the erudite, balanced, and deeply pious mind of a great man, a true, a true man of the church, true son of the church, who suffered for the faith. And he knew lots of people who suffered for the faith. He knew whereof he spoke. He didn't see this as a bound in time or bound only to Russia. He saw this as having universal application. Its timeliness relating to our need for discernment in our circumstances should be obvious to anyone paying attention to the contemporary church situation, which has not improved. It's gone, it's gone immeasurably worse since Andrea's time. Okay. So this is still very relevant. So I took my excursus tonight to justify what we're doing, that we have to make an apologia for why we're doing this. Because there, there will be people who say, oh, Father, don't dig up all this old dirt. That's all, that's all water under the bridge now. Everything's good now. You know, why are you talking about this? We're talking about it because the same problems are still before us, perhaps in different garb, different guys, different players, different methods. The same spiritual uh, uh, battle is still going on. And, this, and we have to imbibe the principles that Andrea is trying to inculcate in the essay in order to deal with the very related problems, or really, in a sense, the same problem in our own time. So that was Father, Father Andrew's uh, email, and I encourage everybody to support Father Andrew. They're, again, their they're press is called Monastery Press. It's very easy to find the internet. Just put in monasterypress.org, and there they are. And they have all their titles are very worthwhile ordering. And uh, he also has a page of free downloads of classic Russian Church Abroad documents. So those, that's a worthwhile page. Just go to that page and just download everything there. It's all, it's all very worthwhile. Okay, part B tonight, another confirmation. We have a confirmation from Subdeacon Nectarius, who wrote the last essay that we discussed about the history of Rokor and the Greek calendars, that the, the, the Moscow Patriot has not rejected, but rather has canonized surgeonism. How do we know they've canonized surgeonism? Because they basically canonized surges. They've built, they're building statues to him. Patriarch Kirill is praising him in speeches. They made a big hoopla celebrating his 80th anniversary, 80th anniversary of his so-called election uh, recently, a couple of years ago. And, um, and recently, uh, uh, at least two issues of the Moscow Patriot Kit in the past, uh, the two issues of the journal, the, the uh, JMP, the Journal of the Moscow Patriot Kit, um, two, at least two issues of it, he's on the front page, he's the poster boy. He's you know, glor being glorified. So if they're glorifying the man, they're also glorifying his choice. And Kirill has, before him, Patriarch Alexis, and after that, Kirill has, on many occasions, uh, justified and made apology for Sergius's decision to do what he did. So we cannot say, no one can say they rejected surgeonism. That is a blatant uh, falsehood. It's just, it's just a very extremely misleading thing to say. Okay, so this, so um, I just want to direct, I want to direct everybody to two essays by Subdeacon. Oh, by the way, Subdeacon Nectarius has contacted me and he thanked me for the talks we did on his article about the history of the Russian Church Abroad and the Greek calendarists. 
And uh, what was what was funny is that is that uh, the first the first talk we did on that subject, no, the second talk I think was in that subject, aroused a lot of ire from certain people who felt I was offending a certain party. And the, the funny thing is that the author of the art, the author of the essay really liked what I said. He really enjoyed <laughs> our discussion of the whole thing. <laughs> so uh, we have at least one one man in our corner, Sadiq Nectarius, who wrote that essay, uh, despite what some other um, uh, unhappy souls thought about it. Um, okay, so um, he, he regarding surgeonism, he has two well-researched articles on his Orthodox Traditionalist website. So I have, here here are the links. I'll post the links on the on the Substack blog and on my on my uh, also my WordPress site. And um, so I'd like everybody to go there and read these two essays. Very not very important. Um, he goes through um, in this first one. Uh, Ecumenism, Searchism, dash, did the Moscow Patriot renounce them in the URL there. This is an article from earlier this year in February, where he says, and in February, remember, everybody's, in world orthodoxy, everybody's obsessed with the, 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 um, this huge chasm now between the, those allied with Russia and those allied with, with uh, Bartholomew, right? And he says, uh, he says many, rightly, I said, many, many of us, uh, conservative orthodox, rightly, Denounced Patrick Bartholomew for his ecumenism, his uh, radical environmentalism, his feminism, his pro LGBT, the whole, and 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 his uh, treasonous behavior in the Ukraine and so forth. Um, and so they see the Moscow Patriot as the conservative alternative. But let me ask you: Has the Moscow Patriot really renounced ecumenism? Have they really renounced surgeonism? Or is, are they really an alternative, or are they a false alternative to Bartholomew, to to the ecumenical patriarchy? And he goes through the article and, and demonstrates how the Moscow Patriot has renounced neither surgeonism nor ecumenism. And then uh, this other article about the letter from the late Metropolitan Anastasi to Patriarch Alexei Simonsky. This is a, a letter, Alexis Simonsky, the first Patriarch Alex, so-called Patriarch Alexis, during and after World War II, addressed the Church Abroad saying, you know, you shouldn't be separated from us, join Moscow, basically. And Metro and the Sassi wrote a long epistle answering him as to why they absolutely would not submit to the Soviet church organization. But, but for our point about uh, the, the, the current MP not giving up surgeonism, illustrations in this article about this letter of Metro and the Sassi, there, Father, Father Nectarius' website is very nicely done. He has a lot of good, he has photos of all these important documents, right? And he has photos of the Journal of the Moscow Patriot, recent Journal of the Moscow Patriot numbers that have Sergius displayed in the front cover. Right? Here's, in other words, they're saying, he's our man. He's our man. Okay. So um, both very, very good articles. So Subdeacon, what I, really, what I really liked in the first article is that Subdeacon Nectarius demonstrates the accuracy of under, his understanding of what Sergianism is in this first article, the first URL I have listed here in a point-by-point -point description of this spiritual phenomenon. And surgeonism is not just a heresy in a theoretical sense. It's a whole antichrist anti spiritual phenomenon. It's, it's a demonic force in the world. It's, it's a, like what, what, what uh, St. Therophon was saying yesterday, uh, Sunday, the sermon Sunday I gave about Shmeiman, about uh, uh, Lika Theophon's words, the carbon monoxide, where uh, surgeonism is this carbon monoxide kind of clouding everybody's mind. It's, it's a whole spiritual atmosphere that people are breathing in. It's not just... It's, it's not just a single heresy, it's a, it's, it's a complex, uh, an ensemble of erroneous ideas and, and at a deeper level, spiritual attitudes and spiritual weakness. Okay. So, so Deacon Nectarius demonstrates the accuracy, accuracy of his understanding of what this surgeonism is uh, by a point-to-point -point description of this spiritual phenomenon. So I, I'm going to read his, his description of surgeonism in full because we keep tossing out this term, surgeonism, surgeonism. Okay, let's define it or at least describe it. He begins, Surgeonism is then a bowing of the hierarchs to the forerunners of the Antichrist, the Soviet regime, their forerunner of Antichrist. I would submit also that today, WHO and the IMF and Davos and the CDC and so forth are also forerunners of the Antichrist regime. And all the Covidian believers won't like that, but that's, it is the truth. Surgeonism is a bowing of the hierarchs to the foreigners of the Antichrist and declaring obedience to them and to their agendas, which history has shown us includes the persecution of the Orthodox Church 
and the murder of its saints. We believe in Sovietism. We believe in murdering the saints. <laughs> That's part and parcel of what orthodoxy is, right? The primary characteristics of churchianism are, first, viewing the church administration, first and foremost, as an organization which must be blindly obeyed, despite its hierarchs teaching bareheaded heresy. As if the voice of the organization is always, without exception, the voice of Christ. So now, now think of when the church was ruled by the Arian faction, or Nestorius, the iconoclast. I mean, it's obviously not true, but that's the idea. You're not with the patriarch. <gasps> You're not orthodox. See? Huh? Yes, it's papism. And even, even the more sophisticated Catholics know that is, even extreme forms of papism don't even claim that, right? That the, the Pope could turn to a heretic and he's still the Pope. Even, even the, the wise, I mean, there, there's a famous essay by Cardinal Bellarmine, you know, demonstrating that when the Pope declares public heresy, he thereby loses his office, you know. So even, even sophisticated Catholics know that it isn't that crude and that stupid, that you have to obey a guy with this title or you're outside the church, okay? no matter what he says, no matter what he does, which is it's just absurd. It's, it, it violates the image of God and man as being a rational creature with free will. You know, it's just, it's just absurd. Okay, but it's, at that point, you're not talking about the church, you're talking about a cult or a mafia or something. You're not talking about the church. If you really believe that, that such a crude uh, idea, such a crude mechanistic idea of what the church is. Okay, secondly, surgeonism is marked by failing to distinguish between the God-given authority of Caesar and the God-allowed authority of the Antichrist rooted in Satan. See Apocalypse 13.2. So we've already, just, we've already covered that with Andreev in his essay, right? The difference between a God-established authority and God-allowed. Okay, God has allowed the Soviets to take over as a punishment for the apostasy of the Russian people, but it's not, a, it's not blessed by God. The Soviet regime is not blessed by God. It is an antichrist authority. Okay. Third, churchianism is marked by lying like Father George Schaefer, <laughs> falsifying that document, right? Lying, doing evil, persecuting the saints, and overturning tradition to supposedly save the church from evil. We're going to save the church from evil by handing over confessors to be tortured and killed. But we're saving the church. We're saving the church. And we're, and we're going to lie, too. We're going to tell the world that there's no persecution of the Soviet Union. So you're liars. So you're saving the church by lying. Okay? And by, by handing over... Uh, your brother to the Antichrist. So you're saving the church. What, kind, what are you saving? What's, what, what does it say that you saved? Right. Four, an idolization, an idolatry of canonicity, using this to quench the spirit. So canonicity falsely understood. Canonicity is as, um, just a legalistic use of the canons to justify an institutional policy. Okay. So it quenches the spirit was it misses the whole point of the gospel. Along with this, surgeonism replaces genuine spiritual life with dead canonical forms. I mean, just watch, just watch a, a patriarchal MP liturgy at a, on a big feast day. It, it's like a ballet of robots. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's so dead. It's ridiculous. It's, it's so fake. It's ridiculous. And I, I'm not saying that you have that same feeling from the little parish churches, but certainly... If you watch these uh, these uh, magnificent, gigantic celebrations in the Church of Christ, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior with the Patriarch, and you know, ten million priests all in exactly matching uh, vestments and all turning at the same time and bowing at the same time, you know, it's it's beyond it's it's beyond uh, liturgical order. It's it's robotic. It's empty. And you can see in their old. Uh, black and white, of course, obviously black and white, um, old videos of pre-revolutionary Russian bishops and priests serving. Yes, it's orderly, but they're human. You know, the, the deacon's flipping his hair behind his head, and the bishop's mitre is askew. I, I saw, I've seen with Petro Chikin, his, his mitre's about falling off. It's kind of <laughs> askew. And they look like real people. They look like they're, pe they're human beings, right? But when you watch these high-level, uh, highly um, orchestrated uh, choreographed Moscow Patriot celebrations. It's like it's you know, like you're watching, you know, it's it's like a Christmas display window with a little little robots, you know, <laughs> doing a ballet or something. You know, it's just so so non-human. So so um, dead canonical forms, 
while failing to distinguish how the church must act during normal times versus times of persecution. Yes, in normal times, you follow these canons of church administration. During times of persecution, you have to perceive the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, or you'll be lost. Right? If, we don't, if we don't imbibe the spirit of the canons and just let anyone with power over us twist the canons and uh, guilt load us to follow them into perdition, well, we've made a fatal error. You know, we've, we've, we've abdicated our responsibility as conscientious Christians. Right? Five, gazing upon the mystery of iniquity and proclaiming Soviet joys and successes are our joys and successes and whose failures are our failures. Thus, the mission of the church is perverted and replaced by something else, whether openly evil or seemingly good. And effectively, a new master is proclaimed as the acting head of the church instead of Christ. Stalin's the head of the church. Lenin's the head of the church. Or now Putin's the head of the church. I don't know who ever. Lenin, I, don't, I don't know who has more power, Putin or Patriarch Kirill. I guess Putin does. But they're, they're kind of, you know, two-headed monster. Okay. Six, sinning against the dogma of the church by perverting her nature. This is very serious. Sinning against the dogma of the church. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. By perverting her nature by identifying the church with Caesar or with the Antichrist instead of with Christ himself. This attempts to turn the church from being the house of salvation to a political or social organization. Now, of course, critics could say, well, in the past, uh, this has been done to some extent. The, the, the um, blatant Erastianism of, of the synod organization under Peter the Great, for example. But that, that was a precursor. It was, you might say, a, a dress rehearsal, but it's not the same level as the cooperation with the Soviet authorities. That's a whole quantum leap into, into blatant Satanism, right? Seven, betraying Christ and trampling upon the truth for the sake of obtaining or maintaining a legally functioning organization. Surgeonism attempts to kill and suppress the organism for the sake of the organization. Now, Catacomb Bishop Mark Novoselov has an important essay about the, the distinction between the church as an organism and an organization organism, organization, and if, for those who've um, listened to my Orthodox survival course, when, if you go back to the, the section in the High Middle Ages, I'm talking about mistakes made by the Western Church. One of them is pancaking or collapsing the concept of the Church of Organism into the organization, that they're exactly the same, that they're, they're coterminous, right? The Church, of course, needs organization. She's in the world, and she has organization, because we're human beings. We have to organize our activities, right? The church is primarily an organism, right, with organizational forms. They're very hallowed forms. There's no reason to replace them without very serious, uh, very serious reasons, right? But the organization cannot, preserving this organ, outward organization cannot trump uh, preserving the faith itself, preserving the sacramental life, preserving the spiritual life. So we, we can't sacrifice the essence of Christianity for the sake of these um, institutional uh, structures, no matter how venerable they are. Eight, denying the spirit of martyrdom, de denying the spirit of confession of the faith, and making before the world a spectacle of the church, representing the church, the body of Christ, as if it were a pathetic slave without freedom or dignity. Many of the catacomb fathers said this, you have destroyed the freedom and dignity of the church. You've punched a knife into the heart of the freedom of the church. The freedom of the church. This is a very old theme, of course, in Christian history, of the, 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 hier the confessing hierarchs and clergy and monks and lay people fighting for the freedom of the church. And um, the church has to be free to do her mission. She cannot so enslave herself. If the, if the secular power protects her and furthers her mission, they are blessed. But if they uh, attack her and prevent her from performing her mission, they, are, they, they have abdicated their role as a God-inspired authority. And, and they are not due obedience. Okay. Number nine, finally, the chiliastic belief. The you know we've talked a lot about chiliasm in various of our classes, right? Chiliasm is the idea. Chilia is the Greek for a thousand. It's the or you can also call it. It's also called losing the Latin. It's called millenarianism, from uh, mille in Latin. And the 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 the, the, the heretical interpretation of the thousand year reign of the saints in the apocalypse. The idea that Christ will come to earth. And establish a reign of the reign of heaven. The reign of God will be on earth for a thousand years. And you take this a religious belief of chiliasm, it can be applied to any utopian scheme 
for creating a kingdom of God on earth, or a kingdom of eternal peace on earth, whether it's the, you know, the, the bright Soviet future or the thousand year Reich or whatever it may be. You know, these are all schemes uh, of the human, the fallen human mind for creating a paradise on earth that, and they always end up creating hell on earth. The Kiliastic belief, the Kiliastic spirit that aims to transform the existing social and political order through the establishment of Christian ideals to form a moral or religious governmental new world order, a kingdom of God on earth. So Sovietism is another form of, of a misguided utopianism, right? And then, the, and, then the, the, and all these silly MP hierarchs and patriarchs praising Stalin or praising Khrushchev or praising Brezhnev or whoever for advancing the ideals of Christianity. You see, through, through a struggle for peace, and world peace. We have Bartholomew all the time, right? World peace and, and uh, brotherhood of man, all this, obviously Masonic uh, ideals. He concludes, Surgeonism, in short, is an idolatry, a heresy, an ecclesiastical renovation, a systematic design, an apostasy from true orthodox ecclesiology. Wow, what an indictment. You know, read it. In short, Surgeonism is idolatry, it is a heresy, it's ecclesiastical renovation, it's schismatic design and apostasy from true orthodox ecclesiology, and ultimately, orthodox doctrine. It's a system of cowardice, a system of non-resistance to evil, a criminalization of confessing the orthodox faith, a denial of God's providence, and a scorning of the neptic tradition of the saints. Why the neptic tradition of the saints? Why, why refer to the philokali in the neptic tradition? We're going to get into that with Andrea. I'm going to put that, I'm, I'm going to Park that for a minute. We're going to talk about that later. Why the neptic tradition? The tradition of the Philokalia and the Jesus prayer. Why is it deny of that? What's that have to do with it? Well, we're going to talk about that uh, in, when we go further into Andreev's essay. But this non-resistance to evil, that's very important. That's that. What's any, Can anybody, okay, here, quiz time. Who is the, the Russian uh, cult leader and famous writer who advocated total pacifism and non-resistance to evil. Come on. Tolstoy. 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 One of the, the fundamental pillars of Tolstoyism is non-resistance to evil. And the great Russian philosopher, Ivan Ilyich, um, uh, no, excuse not Ilyich, Ivan Ilin. Ivan Ilyich is somebody else. <laughs> He's a Dominican, ex-Dominican Catholic who also has some good ideas, but also some wacky ideas. No, Ivan Ilin, Ivan Ilin, a uh, great uh, philosopher of of uh, Russian Orthodoxy, of monarchism, of the, the White Movement in the 20th century, of uh, what people would call reactionary, or uh, we would call it radical, tra radically traditional political ideals and so forth. Ivan Ilin has a very important, long, it's a long essay, it's a quite a, a a, a meaty monograph absolutely demolishing Tolstoy's teaching that the gospel demands non-resistance to evil. And um, very important. So I highly recommend it. Uh, Ivan Ilin, um, I forget the t exact title. You can look it up. It's, a, it's about the non-resistance, the resistance to evil by Ivan Ilin. But you'll hear this all the time. Well, we were so holy. We didn't resist the Soviets. We, you know, we, we, uh, we have to, we forget it's time for healing. We must heal Stalin. We will heal Khrushchev. You know, by our, <laughs> well, they didn't heal. <laughs> you know, what about what about all the people dying in the Gulag? You're going to heal them. You know, by your non-resistance. Um, it's the typical mindset of all the leftists and liberals today, right? Who worry about the criminals and don't worry about the victims, right? But we're going to be so kind to the criminals. We'll heal them by our love. You know, and the criminals just laughing and they're killing more people, right? Um, and there's a time for a man to stand up and be a warrior and fight evil. And certainly, if any time was that time, it was the 20th century and it was the Soviet Union. And, uh, and also the time is now. The time is, it's always now. All right, uh, so that's our little excourses tonight. We have, it's always, you know, you always find allies when you, you, don't, you you've kind of forgotten you have allies. And they, it reminds me of when I find New friends like this. Well, Father Andrew actually is an old friend, but uh, this whole connection with this essay is a new uh, development. Um, but, uh, you know, there's that place in Kings where uh, the prophet Elias says, I want to die. 
they have killed all the prophets of the Lord and I'm the only one left. And God says, no, no, he says, I've reserved myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So if you don't bow the knee to Baal, God, and when you're at your last gasp, God will reveal that 7,000 have not bowed the knee to Baal. So Father Andrew and Sabic Nectarius have not bowed the knee to Baal. And they're our, our allies in this struggle for the truth about church truth, truth about our confession of faith and about the true nature uh, of our struggle for orthodoxy in the 21st century.